At the tail end of the 17th century, as adventurous bands of treasure hunters, trappers and explorers began to journey eastwards from the Russian heartlands around Moscow and St. Petersburg in search of new lands and new riches, not one of them could have predicted the magnitude of the discoveries that they were about to make. To say that Siberia is vast would be an understatement. It spans 10% of the entire world's landmass and crosses a multitude of modern day countries. Much of its northern expanse is made up of inhospitable frozen forests and windswept plains that stretch all the way from the Baltic in the west to the Pacific in the east. Yet just to the south of this permafrosted wasteland lies a long strip of unbroken steppe and grassland from Europe to Mongolia. It was here, into that primal and desolate landscape framed by steep mountains and haunting birch forests, that those early Russian explorers first set foot over 300 years ago. What they found there would change our understanding of the world forever. People lived in Siberia at the time, in much the same way as their ancestors had done for millennia, reading the signs of the elements, living under the stars and tending to their livestock in a timeless pastoral existence. But it wasn't the locals that these Russian explorers were interested in. Rumours and reports had recently begun to surface of mysterious and ancient edifices dotting the inhospitable landscapes of far remote valleys and ancient plateaus. Before long, the rumours became fact, and the Russian explorers began to come into contact with a world so far removed from the present that they could scarcely believe what they had found. The Altai Mountains are an ancient place, a timeless place. Today, mysterious primal standing stones still litter the landscape, and they are bordered by something even more incredible. Hundreds upon hundreds of ancient burial mounds, long forgotten by the world. Most of the mounds are long opened now, but in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, by and large, they were all still sealed off, protected from potential grave robbers by their religious associations for the native Siberians, and by their sheer isolation. Soon enough, the graves began to be carefully opened, and the millennia-old mummified remains of ancient rulers were found within largely preserved by the Siberian permafrost, which protected them all year round since they were first interred there some 2,500 years ago. The mummies were accompanied by vast amounts of ornately carved grave goods, many of which were crafted from pure gold and depicted primal naturalistic battles between animals and monsters. The mummies themselves were clearly members of a ruling class, yet the ornate body-spanning tattoos depicting the same naturalistic battles as the artefacts spoke of an ancient primal time, and a people not just in tune with the natural world around them, but obsessed by it. The people interred in these remote burial mounds at the very edge of the earth were Scythians, the ancient forebears of not only those same nomadic pastoralists who still live in Siberia today, but also the Huns, the Turks, and the Mongols, mighty empires that would go on to conquer much of the settled sedentary world that bordered their homelands. The Scythians were likely the first nomadic culture to spread across the entirety of the Asian steppeland. They thrived from around 900 BC until around 200 BC. And thankfully, for the sake of the human story, not only their grave goods, but also part of their remains were by and large saved from oblivion by the Russian Tsar Peter the Great, who upon realizing the magnitude of the finds, decreed by pain of death that every discovery should be taken directly to him to be installed in a new museum that he had created in St. Petersburg. The Scythians left no writing for us to decipher, nor did they leave any discernible architecture to speak of. Yet the incredible artwork discovered in vast amounts at sites from the Black Sea to Mongolia stand as testament to the intense power and ingenuity of these ancient people. Whilst elements of the same naturalistic culture appear in the tribes that came after the Scythians, such as the Sarmatians, this animal art style that the Scythians left behind as grave goods is completely unique in the world. It's thought to have carried a deep symbolic significance to the Scythians, and as such it appears absolutely everywhere at their burial grounds, on jewellery, weapons, clothing, artwork, and even inscribed into their skin. The style seems to have focused upon three distinct elements, birds of prey, herbivores with hooves and antlers, and monstrous feline predators such as leopards. Without written sources, little can be known with any certainty about Scythian beliefs, though through analysis of their art, a number of scholars have arrived at the same conclusion, that they may have believed in a world divided into three distinct parts. These parts may have in turn been represented by the aforementioned three types of animals, 
often portrayed in battle with one another. A heavenly plane containing birds, the central plane of the world inhabited by mortal humans, portrayed by herbivores such as stags and deer, and an underworld of supernatural beasts. In short, the animal art style may have been intended to portray the way that the Scythians perceived their world, a heaven above, a mortal plane on earth, and an underworld below. The name Scythian is in fact a collective grouping for a confederation of different tribes who all shared the same Iranian dialects and shared a similar lifestyle, dress, weaponry and horse gear. They relied heavily on herding sheep, goats, horses and cattle, not only for sustenance but also for plentiful supplies of leather, wool and hair to make their everyday goods. Other objects, such as gold plaques, were probably made by a separate class of master craftspeople. Intricate examples of rock art throughout Siberia actually predate the Scythians by a thousand years or more. These depictions of mighty horse-drawn chariots thundering across windswept plains hint at a formative period, even before the establishment of a common Scythian culture. It remains to be seen whether these people were proto-Scythians, or another culture entirely, superseded or absorbed into the Scythian one. As the Scythians developed more and more efficient horse riding techniques and equipment over the centuries, they were eventually able to move their herds to new pastures according to the seasons and gradually spread their culture across the entirety of the huge belt of grassland or steppe extending from northern China in the east to the Black Sea in the west. The same steppe lands that would later spawn the Huns, the Turks and finally the Mongols. The Scythians had a keen understanding of the environment they inhabited, which was perfectly suited to their lifestyle of herding and hunting. Horses were vital to their way of life. They provided not only milk, meat and hides, but they were the main means of transport and the driving force behind military power. Expert riders, Scythian men and women, were forever perfecting new types of horse riding equipment, and they excelled at breeding horses for speed and endurance. Horses were exchanged and bartered, and large herds were a sign of high status. Yet deep personal connections seem to have been prevalent too, with certain favourite horses retaining a higher position than their smaller cousins. Horses were even buried alongside their masters. Some Scythian tribes occupied the pastures of the Altai Mountains during the spring and the summer months. Others lived in the forest steppe region, which provided year-round grazing. Others still occupied the arid semi-desert to the south. Yet despite this vast geographical landmass they inhabited and the remoteness of their burial tombs, the Scythian world was by no means isolated. Whilst the Scythians left no written sources of their own, a multitude of other sources exist that were written about them. In the 5th century BC, the Greek historian Thucydides wrote that Scythian mercenaries could regularly be seen working as bodyguards in Athens. In Persepolis, the capital of the Persian Achaemenid Empire, Scythian war leaders are depicted on carvings paying homage to the Persian kings, who they are also recorded by Herodotus as having fought a long series of campaigns against. For centuries, Scythians had traded goods with their settled neighbours in return for items which they could not produce themselves, such as pottery and wine which was consumed in abundance. These interactions must have been tense at times, as the Scythians also regularly carried out raids on border areas. Tribes often fought amongst themselves, but also collaborated when it was in their advantage to do so, such as when they took part in the downfall of the Assyrian Empire in the 7th century BC, and later fought off several invasions by the Persian Achaemenids, by luring the Persians deep into their own territory and inflicting heavy losses on them. By around the 5th or 6th centuries BC, various Scythian tribes had moved significantly westwards sweeping down through the northern Caucasus and pushing into the Middle East, absorbing or driving out the peoples they came up against, and firmly establishing themselves in the psyche of the civilised, sedentary world of city builders. The discoveries of recent centuries have only added to a wealth of new knowledge about this ancient culture. Recently discovered grave goods speak of Greek, Assyrian, Greco-Bactrian, Persian Achaemenid and Chinese influences upon the Scythians. In other words, all of the people that they bordered. Some of these objects were undoubtedly the result of war plunder. Others, however, are much more curious. Some, at least, seem to have been custom made by Greek or Middle Eastern craftsmen for Scythian buyers, and others still appear to have been made by Scythians but incorporate elements of these neighbouring cultures. This seems to corroborate Herodotus' stories of Scythians trading extensively with Greek settlers on the northern shores of the Black Sea in the 7th century BC. By 200 BC, 
The Scythians controlled a vast region, stretching all the way from northern China to the Black Sea. They had outlasted their long-time enemies in Persia, and to a certain extent, the Greeks too. Yet the world was changing, and their time was about to be up. There was no great invasion or last death knell for the Scythians. Their culture was simply superseded over time by newcomers from the east. By around 100 BC, their supremacy over the steppe had gradually come to an end as new groups of nomads pushed westwards. The archaeological evidence indicates that these newcomers coexisted with the indigenous population for several generations. During this time, burial practices underwent significant changes and incorporated both Scythian art style and new elements for a while, until eventually the old traditions simply ceased to exist, leaving the ancient burial grounds of the Scythian kings untouched and undisturbed until they were rediscovered millennia later.